G'day viewers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to the channel. It is time we got back into the land of crypto as people are exiting out of traditional markets and exploring ways to protect their money. We haven't looked at the crypto space for a while. Let's get back into it because it's something I still believe very deeply in and we need to see what some of the big boys are doing in the space of crypto versus fiat currency. I thought this article was quite interesting. It comes from the good people at the Daily Hoddle titled Global Macro Investor Pivoting to Bitcoin Warns Economic Fallout Could Trigger Currency Collapse. It reads, The CEO of Global Macro Investor and Real Vision Group, Raul Powell, says the world is facing several economic outcomes in the wake of the coronavirus, and none of them are good. In an interview on the What Bitcoin Did podcast, the former Goldman Sachs hedge fund manager says governments are doing the right thing by firing up the printing press and injecting cash into the financial system. The real problem, he says, is what happens if the widespread economic fallout lasts longer than just a few months. Now, I'm going to read a quote from Raoul Powell. Uh, not all of it I agree with, but some of it I do. Um, but in any case, we all come to the same conclusion that people are looking at the issues of fiat currency losing its value. He quotes, In the Cayman Islands, I just got a call from the bank. They've just paused my mortgage for three months. OK, great. They can't pause it for six because they're going to be out of business. So my fear is, after this, this period, what does the world look like? And if that's the case, then it's going to be ongoing unemployment. So for many of our friends, it's going to be tough. It's difficult. The governments will then try to borrow more money to try and help people. Again, it's the right thing to do. The problem is, if you're taking essentially all of the economic burden, plus helping people with their debts and people with their mortgages, you're basically taking all of the economic burden and all of the debts and putting it on the government balance sheet. People in the UK remember they did this with the banks, but now they're doing it with the credit markets, maybe the equity markets, maybe the pension system and the economic losses. The only way to fund that is by printing money and if every country is doing it at the same time, you're going to create an environment where money is worth less. Now that does, now, does that mean we get inflation? I think in a debt deflation, which is what this is, we don't create inflation, but we create a situation where the purchasing power of money versus, let's say, gold or Bitcoin will go down. Okay, so on that point, the, the reality is if we reduce the purchasing power of money, it's a type of inflation. Whatever the fundamental principle behind it, whether it's because of debt inflation or a debt crisis or governments printing huge amounts of money, the outcome is the same. Your money is worth less because you don't have the same purchasing power today as you did yesterday. And as a result, it's a form of inflation that's taking away your purchasing power. And when you don't have purchasing power with the money that you've earned over the last few years, it's eroding your savings. Now, here's an interesting point before we read on with the article. Consider this. Banks are separate to governments, so they say. And governments are borrowing money off banks, whether it be a Federal Reserve, a Reserve Bank, or a bank itself. They're borrowing money from these banks to help the economy in which they operate. And ironically, it's going to be your taxes and my taxes, whether that be through taxes of a goods and services tax, an earnings tax, a capital gain tax, or an inflationary tax, which is the invisible tax. One way or another, you will be paying governments for them to pay back the banks who lent the money in the first place. And the icing on the cake, it's the banks who created this whole issue to start with. No, it was not the coronavirus that created this cr crisis. It was the pin that popped the, the bubble, the balloon, if you will, of, that we, of the situation we're in. We knew that this crisis was coming. We knew there was going to be a collapse. No one really just predicted, except for perhaps Bill Gates in one of his TED Talks, where he spoke about what would happen during a global pandemic. But that aside, many of us didn't forecast, if, in fact most of us, if not all of us, didn't forecast that this global collapse would be because of a bug. But in any case, it doesn't matter. If we had more robust financial systems and money that was based on real value as opposed to printing presses and debts to private entities or non-elected entities, we'd be in a very different situation. So not only are we going to be in a situation when the banks are lending money out and governments are printing asking printing presses to press print to push all this money into the economy. Not only is our money going to be eroded in its value, but our governments are going to be left in immense amounts of debt. So it's a double hit when it comes to what we're facing. And this is, of course, beyond the actual human side of this, the physical loss of life and health and the emotional loss 
of careers and loved ones. This is going to be bigger than anything that we've seen hopefully ever in our lifetimes, but if there is a second round, it could get even worse. But let us read on. Pal continues to say, and we will see a system where I, th and I think Japan gets to it, where it ends up buying all of its debt and putting it on the balance sheet of the bank, in which case currencies can collapse. That does look like that could be one element of hyperinflation or high sustained inflation would be the collapse of currencies at the end of this. In this environment, Powell says he's now allocating 25% of his liquid net cash to Bitcoin despite the extreme volatility and risk involved with investing in the emerging asset. Quote, this is exactly why Bitcoin exists. This was the problem that it was built for to start with. In that world, where the financial system is struggling, while the ability to make payments to have a store of value and to record ownership are basically the three tenant values of what Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and the blockchain overall does. And that's a very reassuring thing, to know there's a plan B. Now, maybe that doesn't all happen, but my fear is for everybody, and this is talking to non-finance people, be really careful in assuming this goes away quickly. Powell says the best case scenario is a return to economic normality in September or October. In the meantime, he's turning to BTC, cash, physical gold, and looking for trading opportunities while tra trying to earn as much money as he can. All I know is there are several outcomes that are very bad. One is everything returns to normal. Another is a slightly U-shaped recovery. And by September, October, we're seeing the back end of this is okay. Let's use that as our base case. That's fine. That's fine. But we as humans have to plan for the worst case scenario. We need to make sure we can survive it economically. I don't know the outcome. My hunch is it goes on longer. So, so a really powerful article here that leaves us with a lot of food for thought. Primarily, we want to talk about inflation with the dilution of everyone's money. But secondarily, I also want to speak about the options that we have of gold versus Bitcoin. The older generation is probably more comfortable with gold, whilst the younger generation who really get the technology of cryptocurrency are more uh, attuned to the fungibility and usability of Bitcoin. For many people who hold gold, they don't necessarily hold it on their person or on their property because it's big, it's heavy, and you need security to, security to physical security that costs money to protect this asset. Now, the same applies for Bitcoin, except for it being big and heavy and the physical security. Yes, you may need physical security if you've got a ledger that you want to hide away somewhere, but if you set up cryptocurrencies in a certain way where you have a string of words that you can memorize, a bit risky, but it is an example of where you don't actually need physical security to keep unlimited stores of value. In theory, you can hold as much Bitcoin as you like, up to 21 million coins that is, uh, many of which are missing, and you wouldn't be able to buy them all, but if the market value of that coin is going up and you can memorize the string of words, the seed words that would get you access to your digital wallet, there's actually no physical security for that, just the security of yourself. Conversely, if you had, let's say, I don't know, $10 billion worth of gold, you'd need a big vault for that. You would need a huge amount of security for that, and if you wanted to move it, you would need a significantly big uh, transport method and secure transport method to move it around. If you were fleeing interstate or internationally, you would not be able to do it. You wouldn't be able to do it because in many instances it would probably be stopped at a border, depending which country you're in. Certainly if you're flying internationally, the regulation is about $10,000. That's pretty much $10,000 worth of cash or gold is pretty much all you can carry. So when it comes to fungibility, it could be huge amounts or small amounts. That is, if I want to buy something on Amazon and I'm trying to do it with gold, that's very difficult. If I want to do it with crypto, provided Amazon accepts crypto, it's very simple and it's a system that we already use now. But of course, when we talk about holding gold in a, by a third party, which some people do, the issue with holding gold in a third party is it leads us back to the fiat system. That is, let's say I've got a million dollars worth of gold, I put it in a centralized vault, they issue me a banknote or a credit or a piece of paper or something, a certificate that says, yeah, we've got this gold, and I use that certificate, that banknote, that credit, whatever you want to call it, to go shopping with that gold that's in someone's vault. Everyone thinks that it's my gold, including myself, but the reality is it's creating a system of fiat where eventually that piece of paper will be delinked from the gold that may not have even been there in the first place. To close off, let's check out what is happening in the crypto markets. 
Over to CoinLib.io, we can see Bitcoin is currently sitting at 7,041 US dollars, up half a percent in the last 24 hours. Ethereum, $173. XRP, not doing much, sitting there at the 18 US cent mark. Tether, of course, at a dollar. Bitcoin Cash, 231. Bitcoin SV, position 6 at 194 US dollars. Litecoin slipping down, position 7 at $42. Binance Coin at 15. And EOS in position 9 at $2.61, with Tezos holding that number 10 position at $2.90. $2.09 rather. Chainlink is something that's been coming up in the markets a fair bit. A bit of talk from the Winklevoss brothers saying that it's something that's quite big. I'm not giving financial advice but I am looking at that coin a bit more. At position 11 currently at $3.45. Biggest movers after the last 24 hours. Aragon the biggest gainer in the last 24 hours with a code of ANT up 33.85% to $0.94. Cents. Well done Aragon. Another big mover is Enigma, about position number 5, 144 on the charts, but up 13%. The biggest losers in the last 24 hours, top losers, Quash, Q-A-S-H, or Cash, down to a price of 9 cents, dropping not hugely, only 11% in the last 24 hours. That would be a big number in traditional stocks, but in crypto, it's just another day on the battlefield. Looking at also Holo Token, we know a while ago Holo Token had a huge run up in the markets. Perhaps we're seeing some pullbacks. Last 24 hours dropping 2.31% to a price of 0.0003 cents. That isn't a much, much of a movement, especially for a coin with that market cap volume and unit price. Here's a modern joke of the day to finish off with a laugh. How do you weigh a millennial in Instagrams? That's terrible. I'm Adam Stokes. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe. Hope you're all doing well. Talk to you next time.